Então... Right. Uh, Dr. Prashad, can you hear? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we'll start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third day of uh, pre-intern training. So today we have lined up some very interesting uh, topics for you in collaboration with College of uh, Emergency Medicine of Sri Lanka. We thank uh, Dr. Gandhi Samarajiva, the president of College of uh, Emergency Medicine, for organizing the program tailor-made for the pre-interns because uh, this program was initially started at, at, under the Accident Emergency Care Project training of medical officers prior to their intern appointments. So this, go, uh, this is a very important se uh, session today we are having. So uh, uh, first lecture is done by Dr. Prashant T. Prashant, uh, consultant emergency physician at uh, Base Hospital Pandura. So the, the theme is approach to a patient in emergency medicine. Uh, over to you, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, Dr. Prashant, for a kind introduction. And thank you for uh, Ministry of Health uh, inviting us for this uh, training the young doctors. So welcome. This is the third day. So today we are going to discuss mainly uh, all about the emergencies. So this is a schedule for today. So the initial approach to patient with the emergency, then advanced life support, sick child and trauma resuscitation, evaluation of chest pain, and evaluation of shortness of breath, and evaluation of reduced conscious level. So this is a schedule for today. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Bashar, we can hear you. Right. So now we will straight away start the uh, presentation. So, so this is uh, this title being designed for approach to a deterioration patient. So any critical ill patient coming to the doorstep to the hospital or any patient, inpatient, you are a house officer, they may be in a medical ward or maybe in a uh, surgical ward or genonops ward or pediatric ward, already in a patient, the, the nurses are calling you, the patient is very bad. Can you come and see? So any approach for the deterioration patient, how you are going to sort it out? So before this, I would like to tell a story to you guys. This is a real one. So uh, when I start an internship, the first post, uh, so for first casualty day, I came for a rest in a, maybe in a 2.30 in the early morning. Then in, maybe in a 20 minutes after, maybe around roughly around 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a call. There is a significant burn patient comes to the department doctor can you please come here urgent okay then rush to the the ward from the quarters so the casualty ward then i saw it's a massive like maybe around 70 to 80 percentage burn a lady young lady she cl claimed it's accidental burn but is doubtful about uh, deliberate self-harm or suicidal attempt. I don't know what to do. This is the first appointment, my internship just after the medical school. Uh, pass, having passed the exam with some classes as well, but still I can't remember what to do when you see a patient. So first thing what I do is I call my register. He's also in the middle of the sleep. He said, Okay, okay, it's going to be a very bad prognosis. Do the initial management, I will see in the morning. Do the basic management, I will see in the morning. I have, a, so what do you mean by the basic management? So I, I was curious whether to go and read the book or read the lecture notes or what to do or ask from someone else. 
So this is happening. I think every doctor will have a similar kind of story. So let me take you some um, some few cases for you guys. Make it very in interesting and the real cases. There is a forty-five year old man. Is brought to your hospital with a sen severe central chest pain and soreness of breath. You are the intern medical officer on duty. No other history is available. Severely dyspneic. Saturation is around 90%. Blood pressure is 210, 110. And very sweaty. What are you going to do? Second case, a 55-year-old man present with a fever and soreness of breath. He is severely dyspneic, saturating around 82% on the room air, and blood pressure is quite okay, but central cyanosis and significantly dyspneic. And relations are asking, doctor, please save my father. Poor in, as a poor intern house officer, how are you going to save him? Then again, in a young man, 28-year-old man, brought by 1990, following a road traffic accident. Reduced consciousness with a GCS of 7. Heart rate is 125 with a blood pressure of 80 by 4. 50, saturating 90%, vomiting and snoring. In front of you, this is not theory questions, guys. What to do, what's MCQs or SCQs. There is a patient with the bleeding. So what are you going to do? A 55-year-old man patient with this chronic kidney disease has been getting treatment for cellulitis of the lower limb in your ward. He suddenly become unresponsive. As an intern house officer, what would you do? He's in a surgical ward, maybe calling a medical team. What do you guys do? Before calling a medical team, do you want to see and stabilize the patient and assist the patient? So, during this, the 40 minutes of lecture or in the half an hour of lecture, what we are going to do is the general approach to any immediate life-threatening condition, that's called a resuscitation protocol or resus protocol. And this lecture, we will be reinforced and organize the theory, what you know, already know. That's the main thing. Most of you guys, you know the thing. So you can't, so if the patient come with a dysphagia, that's fine, you can go to a washroom, and read the book and come back and see. There's no impending life threatening. But here you can't get vanished or go and some, read somewhere if there is a real emergency. So you should be able to identify very uh, generic systematic approach that's called a resuscitation protocol. So let me introduce. So what's, what do you? why do you need a general approach to start with before introducing this general approach? So we need a general approach to stabilize a seriously ill patient, regardless of diagnosis. We all are so keen to identify a diagnosis. In a real world, it will take time. And also, it will be, you will be missing important steps to save the life if you only focusing on the diagnosis. And also the general approach, the research protocol or any general approach should have easily learned 
and easily recover under the stressful scenario. When it comes to emergency, it's very stressful. Patient is really bad. And there are some golden hours, so platinum minutes matters. And there are lots of pressure from the patient and the relations. And also sometimes emotionally also very stressful in the kid. The patients are related and are stressful. And also sometimes those kids or maybe a man looks like your parent. So how you are going to, you are going to remember the all the things about the chest pain, no. You should be, the general approach should be easily learned and easily recall and reproducible under stressful scenario. So the approach, we go for a blueprint. The, the five stages are there. The resuscitation protocol, which we have. Uh, five stages are there. One is a charging the patient. Initial stabilization, directed history and examination, commence the specific treatment, then the ongoing care. Five stages, the try the patient, initial stabilization, directed history and examination, commence a specific treatment and ongoing care. So throughout this lecture, we will be focusing on this blueprint throughout the uh, today, the whole day, we will be focusing on this blueprint. What's the traditional more model, medical model? You take a history, you take a long history, don't leave the history you ask about how many toilets are there, what's the size of the toilet, what's the size of the window, What's the uh, kitchen size? How often you wash the bed sheet and so on, so far? Then you examine and you do some, you have diag differential diagnosis and you do text, some tests or investigation to confirm your diagnosis and assess the severity and you start the treatment. Is it practical when you deal with a seriously ill patient? who needs a time-critical management. Sometimes you, you don't have anyone to take history. Can you do a all head-to-toe examination if the patient is struggling to breathe and about to die in a peri situation? Can you have always the diagnosis? Answer is no. So this model, the old school model, is a non-emergent space. Yes, the history exam and diagnosis or test and the diagnosis. But when it comes to an emergency, when it comes to a seriously ill or critically ill patient, this model don't really work. So that's why we stick to this blueprint. So we are going to go one by one, all five stages. The first stage in the blueprint is charging the patient. What do you mean by now in a hospital, you would see, you would heard about the charging mainly in the mass casualties. This is not the, that charging. This is a hospital charging. So now almost most of the hospitals would have this charge. Why do you have a charge to categorize a patient to put the patient in an appropriate area. That means patient has to go to a resuscitation area or treatment area or patient can go to a ward. So in an appropriate area, you are allocate according to the category. An appropriate time, time of the treatment. Within 10 minutes, I have to treat this patient immediately. I have to attend within 10 minutes or within 30 minutes. So all the, uh, because all the patients, we are not going to see it at immediately. So we have to categorize to allocate the resources. And also we are not going to do a first come, first serve 
in a patient coming to the emergency department. We are not going to do a first come first survey because this will charge and the charge according to the card category we will be so yes, sir. and also the charge is very important when it comes to a COVID screening. So there are mainly we stick to a four charging categories the charge category one, two, three, and four. The one is seriously ill patient. So the patient has to take the resuscitation area and has to be seen immediately. Two, emergency, yes, within 10 minutes. Three, category three is uh, urgent. Maybe you can wait up to 30 minutes. And four, semi-urgent. Maybe a walk-in patient can wait up to 60 minutes. So the charge is very important to allocate the patient in appropriate area and appropriate uh, uh, time when to see the patient. And also, you should remember, remember appropriate personal protective equipment are important. You don't overdo the personal protective equipment. And also, you should save yourself in order to save the patient. But if you don't, because don't cover all the body, then it will, you also will be in very uncomfortable position. And also, patient and the appropriate care to the patient also won't be delivered. So appropriate personal protective equipment is important. It's being, the directive is being given by a Ministry of Health. So it's very easy. Now, after the charge, now we are going to the second stage, the initial stabilization. What has been traditionally said, check the ABCDs. It's a very blind statement. So as an emergency physician, we check very systematically and very uh, detailed uh, initial stabilization. So first thing, why this A, B, C, D come? Why it didn't come like a C, B, A or some D, E and some other order? Because which one killed the patient first? And also here, the assessment and the treatment comes together. So if there is a danger in airway, you establish the airway before going to the breathing. So you don't do A, B, C, D assessment and then come and stabilize. So because we all know that airway compromise kill the patient first, then the breathing, then the circulation, then the disability, then the environment and the temperature. So that's why that order is, we check in a, a B, C, D order because we all know the which one will kill the patient. And also please remember the assess, start the assess and also if there is a life threatening sorry life saving treatment has to be given at that point and also if you are let me if you identify any abnormality stop the sequence treat the abnormality and continue sometimes treatment would be a very simple one maybe a airway manual chin lift and jaw thrust and head tell. And also, while assessing a patient, if the patient suddenly deteriorates in the midway, then go back from the beginning. Again, start from airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So reassessing a patient is very important in between if the patient deteriorates. Right. So now in the initial stabilization, the step, one is the first step, is the positioning the patient. What's appropriate for a uh, position? So in a dysnic patient, what's appropriate position for a dysnic patient? You can discuss, you can tell answers. We all know. Anyone want to try? 
we all know it's a propped up position or sitting position or comfortable position. Why? Why an asthma or COPD patient has to be propped up? Why heart failure patients should be sitting up position? So heart failure patient or in acute pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, if the patient is set up, so the fluid will be in the lower part of the lungs. So the upper part of the lung relatively dry and it will be helpful for a air exchange. Now the question is, why asthma patient or COPD patient has to be, they like to be in a sit-up position? The reason is when the patient lies down, what happens the abdominal content will push the diaphragm up. So the, the, the functioning vital capacity of the lung is rustic. The diaphragm goes up, so the lung volume goes down. So it's, it's a mechanically unstable position. And also, when the patient sits up, very easy to use his accessory muscles. Maybe use a hand as a tripod position. And also he can use the accessory muscles easy. So majority, and also child with the partial AIV obstruction, they also like to sit the same reason. Status epileptical or fitting patient, what's the best position? One, maybe a left lateral position to prevent the aspiration. Or if you have good suckers, suction manoeuvres, then it may be a good to keep the patient in a supine position and suck out the secretion. Because if you put in a left lateral position, the access to the patient is putting a cannula, putting a ECG lead, checking a blood pressure, all very difficult. When So sometimes in a fitting patient also, if they have, if the patient is not significantly vomiting, and if you have a suction manual, you might go for a, so fine position. Pregnant patient, what's the main worry? The gravid uterus will be compressing a iota and IVC, iota cable compression. Maybe putting a patient in a less lateral position would be very useful. Majority of the time, if the patient is conscious, the patient knows what's the best position to him. Right. So next step, airway. So after putting an appropriate position, then the second step in a initial stabilization, airway. The first thing is maintain the patency of the airway. Airway is not being obstructed or blocked. So there are ways of maintaining. How do you check it? Look, listen, feel. Look, is there is any secretions? and feel for any, uh, uh, sorry, listen to any obstructed airway pattern like snoring, maybe a strido, and also look the airway is obstructed breathing pattern, and also hear any obstructed feel, uh, feel for any obstruction as well. So if there is obstruction, then if there is a secretion, you suck out the secretion, and also, uh, then airway manuals and airway adjuncts comes to play. So airway adjuncts like a oropharyngeal airways. So first thing is do you do a triple manual. So chin lift, head tilt, and jaw thrust. And if you if there is no obstruction after the triple manual, then you might consider to put the airway adjuncts like oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway. Or you might go have to go for a definitive airway such as an endotracheal tube. Then protection of the airway. The main worry of the protection of the airway is preventing aspiration. So, how do you protect the airway? It's mainly by putting a definitive airway cuff tube in an endotracheal tube. It's a protecting airway majority of the time. 
in the airway if there is a trauma then the cervical spine protection also comes in the airway assessment then the third step after the position then the airway then breathing inspection palpation percussion auscultation and saturation the main important measures are measure the respiratory rate if there is a inadequate respiration you might have to assess the breathing by bag valve measure the saturation and if the saturation is less than 94 percentage then you might have to give oxygen and auscultation also important step then the circulation see for circulation so we check for pulse the both the peripheral and the central pulse especially if there is no central pulse you if the patient is unresponsive and not breathing it's a patient it's cardiac arrest you have to commence a cpr if the pulse is present you have to check the volume and the rate blood pressure the systolic and diastolic and the pulse pressure and capillary refilling time and peripheries are called a warm so these are the main measures to identify the shock the as a doctor you should be able to identify a compensated shock and decompensated shock and irreversible shock so we don't only check the blood pressure here we check the pulse the rate and the volume blood pressure the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure and the pulse pressure capillary refilling time and peripheries are called or warm if there is a call where is a call line up to which level the call line is there and also you do attach the monitors and if there is uh, life threatening rhythms you have to correct it in assessing the circulation putting iv cannula and taking a blood for important blood test like the venous blood gases or electrolytes are important and if the patient is hemodynamically compromised if appropriate you might have to consider to give iv fluids once you stabilize a circulation you move on to a disability disability means as a neurological disability so there are mainly a three components are there pupil both sides you compare the pupil size and also whether it is reactive to light or not the gcs the glasgow coma score and the focal neurological deficit the simply what you can grossly you can assess the focal neurology ask the patient to move all four limbs so you can ask ask him to raise the right hand left hand left arm and left leg and the right leg separately you can ask this is, this is a gross assessment in a initial stabilization assessing that would be helpful if the gcs is less than 8 you might consider to go for intubating and protecting the patient why 8 less than 8 why not 9 not 10 not 5 but how this magic number comes as a any guesses if you have questions or if you are reluctant to answer you can type it uh, if you have questions also you can put it in the comment area so why this eight comes is when you have a low gcs the reflex reflex so coughing and gagging reflexes also coming down especially when it comes to a deep coma with when the gcs is eight or low then the gagging and coughing reflexes absent so if there is a secretions in the airway 
it won't be coughed out, so it goes to the airway and aspirate. So, if the GCS low, less than eight, you might have to consider consider to go for a protecting airway for a definitive airway. So, endotracheal tube for tracheostomy is needed. Right. So then, in a after the disability, the ex exposure and environment control. So, especially you might have to expose the patient and see. Here, you might have to check the temperature and look for the rashes. If there is a trauma, look for any other injury. So, adequate exposure with maintaining a dignity of the patient. If needed, a chaperone also very important. And if you are checking opposite sex sex or children, chaperone is very important. Appropriate exposure also important. We are not going to expose all the critical ill patients uh, fully exposed. If necessary, we will be adequately exposed. So that's also part of the initial stabilization. Looking for, sometimes you miss very important signs if you don't expose. And in the initial stabilization, other than the A, B, C, D, measure, monitor, and reassess also comes. Measure the temperature and capillary blood sugar is very important. Measuring a capillary blood sugar, major, sometimes we tend to forget, and it's a fatal mistake. Checking a temp, uh, checking a capillary blood sugar or blood sugar level B, B. And monitor ECG rhythm, saturation, and the blood pressure is very important as well. And also, if you have any concern or if there is a deterioration, reassessing a patient in a regular interval also important because the patient condition is dynamic. It might change maybe in 10 minutes or 5 minutes or in a half an hour. Just because of blood pressure was normal, I say check the blood pressure normal, you can't tell. You have to reassess the patient. Once you have stabilized the patient only, you go for a directed history and examination. Main here, the main focus of the immediate illness, rather than asking lots of questions in a practical real world, you might be focusing on the disease. If there is a chest pain, you will be asking a detailed chest pain history, important history, and looking for some differential as well, looking for any contraindication for my treatment. And also you might be asking about the medical history and risk factors and medication history. Those are very important. So that's so directed history and examination is very important. And also you will be focused and you save the time. So always, I always tell interns and the junior doctors, before asking a history and exam, you should be asking yourself why you are asking those things. Rather than just blindly asking the stuff, you might have to focus and ask about the history and exam. Then the commencing a specific treatment identify and the time critical ma management is very important because there are some example if there is an acute coronary syndrome or ST elevation MI, the time is muscle. Sooner the treatment, the better the prognosis. So giving a dual antiplatelet, maybe thrombolizing a patient is very important. So time critical management is very important. So usually a standard is after ECG diagnosis, the patient should have a thrombolysis for a STEMI within 20 minutes time. And stroke thrombolysis, again, time is a brain here. So we have to, uh, the earlier the treatment, the better the outcome. So the commencing a treatment, specific treatment is very important. Some antidotes for the poisoning is very important. Giving of fluids for a uh, septic shock patient. So likewise, the commencing a specific treatment or giving antibiotic for septic shock patient is very important. After, so within a one hour, we have to give a 
broad spectrum empirical antibiotic. So the time critical management is very important. Then the ongoing care. So the, when there is ongoing care, please remember, reassess, reassess, reassess the patient. Because the patient condition is not static, it's a dynamic. And also, you might have to think about when it's, if the patient is in the emergency department or any accident and emergency or ETU, you might have to consider whether the patient can be has to send it to an intensive care unit or general medical or surgical ward, or patient has to be transferred to a tertiary care center. If the patient is being transferred, you have to, before transferring a patient, you have to stabilize the patient. So that's the, one of the important steps. You can't transfer the unstable patient to tertiary care center. Because in, when you can't do much things while in the ambulance. Even you can't put a cannula while in the ambulance. You have to stop the ambulance. So you have to stabilize the patient before you transfer the patient. And also when you are transferring, you have to make sure all the instruments are ready. Adequate oxygen are re ready in case of normal say, blood pressure drop do i have adequate iv fluids so likewise you have to have a checklist then handing over the patient or you that's very important or when you communicate with the other department it's always very important most of our doctors junior doctors are lagging this handing over the easiest step is a isba the mnemonic call is bar, I S B A R. I for introduction. So you introduce yourself. I am so and so. I am doctor. Uh, so and so. And I am an intern house officer. I am I speaking to so and so. You have to make sure the receiving end also appropriate, correct person. You are talking to the correct person. Introduction. Then you tell the situation because sometimes you tell all the things. The receiving and person told us why he is telling. So I I have a very unstable patient who is having a STEMI with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. I need your opinion on thrombolysis. You tell what's the situation and why I am so situation is. Then the background history. What are the background like hypertension, diabetic? Then the assessing the patient, what has happened and what's the assessment of the patient and ask for recommendation. So I need this patient, your opinion or this one for thrombolysis. I need the ICU bed for this patient. So likewise, the recommendation. So it's the introduction, background, sorry, introduction, situation, background, assessment, and recommendation and the treatment which we, we have given. So that's the fifth and the last stage of the ongoing care. Any questions? Can I get a soft copy of the lecture? Yes, we will be providing the soft copy. I will be sharing a comment area, so don't worry about that. Any other questions? Right, now, in the absence of question, try to sum up what we have discussed. Again, I'm sticking to the research protocol, the blueprint, five stages, charging the patient with the appropriate personal protective equipment, initial stabilization in an ABCD approach, e and also measure, monitor, and reassessment, directed history and examination, 
focusing on the disease and the relevant information, commence specific treatment for this patient, then the ongoing care, which include the ongoing care, reassessment, and transfer to the tertiary care center or transfer to appropriate place. And also important one of the steps is a handovering the patient. So the summary, this approach can be used by any doctor with a basic diagnostic skills and experience because it's systematic, easily learned, readily recall under stressful scenario. That's the most important thing. Whatever you learn, you might have a distinction in all the subject and first class. But if you can't recall, in a stressful real situation, it goes in vain. Majority of the time, that would be the case. You might know very fine detail about the SLE. But in an airway deterioration patient coming to you with a major trauma, lots of blood, hypovolemic, you won't be able to save the patient. So very simple. If you stick to the blueprint, Right, so there is a so there is a question is can you please give a brief management of each cases? The answer is I'm because my purpose of giving these four cases are not to discuss guy, just to Just to thinking of you guys to get involved in this lecture and start the thinking process because detailed discussion of each cases will be de will be deal with the real when you have a patient. Our main purpose of this lecture is a systematic approach. Thank you very much. So next lecture is, uh, I will be sharing the, uh, this lecture in the, in a comment area. So you can uh, look at the, uh, Uh, in the comment, uh, so the next lecture is we are going to discuss the advanced life support. I know we had you had a live ALS yesterday as well, but we will be revising your ALS as well today. And also in an emergency physician point of view, how we approach also will be discussed uh, by Dr. Ganajay Samaravira. Ganajay, over to you. Thank you, Prashant. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, Dr. Prashant, can you make me uh, co-host? So I didn't know that they had the lecture yesterday, ALS. So I can finish it in 15 minutes, right? Hmm. <laughs> Not exactly. <yeah. laughs> so, yeah. so lucky guys, you will be uh, getting extended tea break. Okay, let, let me... Okay. Can you? Is it okay? Can you see my screen? Yeah. I want to go full screen. Okay. 
Right. Thank you. Welcome to Advanced Life Support Lecture. Uh, so I may ask some questions from you regarding uh, Advanced Life Support. Let me see whether we are going as an alphabetical order or... Right. Bhatia, Bhatia, are you there? Bhatia Vendakon. Logvela Nididda Nane, Nirasha, Nirasha Ratnayaka. Can you switch on your mic? Nirasha, are you there? Nirasha or Nirasha? I don't know. Ah, Bhatia. Bhatia is there. Okay, Bhatia. Um, tell me how you know uh, whether the patient has got a cardiac arrest. It's okay. You can make mistakes. Don't worry. Nobody's at cardiac arrest now. How do you recognize a patient whether the patient is in cardiac arrest? I can't hear you. You can type in, I suppose. <laughs> That's fine. Never mind. Since the technology is obstructing our interaction, we will go back to the lecture. Right. So, we will talk about the chain of survival. I, I'm sure you must have uh, learned this. And then how to identify the cardiac arrest. And little bit on the Chat ALS. Box, they have some answers to change. Sorry. Chat box, they have answers. Ah, right. Unresponsive. No pulse, no breathing. That's wonderful. Sure. Thank, thank you, Bhati. Right. And then uh, reversible causes. And then how you do the post resus care. So I, I'm sure now you all are going to become intern house officers. Right. Then if there is a cardiac arrest, Oh, a patient who's again a ET you get a hurry, I see you get a hurry, do an academy, a choke and a good Raja Kari, right? So now you have to practice advanced life support that will maximize the patient's outcome. But nevertheless, before going to the cardiac uh, advanced life support, the very important concept is the chain of survival. We'll see what it is. Right. So the chain of survival contains four parts. Make a dangwalak survival chain, right? So dangwala has four puruk, right? Early recognition and call for help is the first part. Why? To prevent the cardiac arrest. So what will happen if a patient get a cardiac arrest? Despite we talk a lot about ALS, blah, blah, ECMO, KI, AROM, EMO, everything, but very few will survive. Once you get a cardiac arrest, in our setting, maybe 2-3% two, two, will survive. If you get 100 arrests, maybe 2-3 will go home alive or with a good neurological in, uh, output. So, now the problem is, so now you have to Prevent the cardiac arrest. How do you prevent? You need to recognize the deteriorating patient. When you work in the hospital, patients usually they don't die suddenly. Right? It doesn't happen usually. Very rarely patients die suddenly. But they will show some deterioration. And you, you are expect to detect them and manage accordingly, right? So how do you manage? If the patient become tachypneic, if the patient become tachycardic, if the patient become hypoxic, now the patient saturation drops, you need to escalate the care. You need to inform your seniors and you need to make up an escalating plan. 
either patient should go to the ICU or either patient might have some sort of a abnormality that you can reverse it at the early stage. So it is very, very important to prevent the cardiac arrest, though this lecture is about cardiac arrest and uh, ALS. Okay. The second one is the early CPR. Why you give early CPR? To buy time. So CPR won't bring your patient back. It only gives you a little bit of time until you fix the problem. So this is very important for you to understand. You give CPR for what? To buy time. In that case, every minute you postpone CPR, the mortality or the survivability will drop by 10%. So if you wait till 10 minutes, the mortality will be, or even the recoverable is 0%. Okay. The next is the early defibrillation. So that's why we always call for help. You need to get the defibrillator. That is the mighty machine. If the patient is indicated a shock, you need to shock them early to restart the heart. So that if the problem is an arrhythmia or a um, non-perfusing arrhythmia or life-threatening arrhythmia, whatever it is, you need to defib. That is the only option to bring them back. Okay. Then the post resus care. So what will happen? Now you do ALS and you shock them, you reverse what are the problems and then the patient come back to life. Now you can see the patient has pulse, right? You can see the brain is gray color, alupada brain, now brain become light blue at least. The brain right? So that is the brain. Okay, Miss La Hena Menemia Hari Palstira Mama Cantina Gila take up Bill and Angela. You go. That is not the way. You need to give the good post resus care to restore the quality of life. Or even otherwise, if you don't give a good post resus care, the patient will go back to cardiac arrest. Simple as that. It would make a chain a kaki and nai make a hammer part a kakma. It should be equally strong for the chain to be strong. Make a tuna quitter on the term strong villa, a cup weak nung, then it is not going to help the patient. Okay. The next, I'm sure this is what you may have been learning. So if the patient is unresponsive or not breathing normally, make a kohevat kill and a pulse alarm, right? But Bhatia said, you check the pulse and there's no pulse. A muka the him villa. Anybody want to answer? Charita Kalupahana, Charita Kalupahana, Charita Kalupahana. This is the advanced life support algorithm, but nobody says here you check the pulse to start ALS. But you look for unresponsiveness and you look whether the patient is breathing. Normally or not. Raja Yohan, I'm going to wake you up in this early morning. Yes, sir. Yes. Why does it doesn't say to check pulse? But Bhatia said you check pulse, no pulse, no breathing or no abnormal breathing and unresponsive. Make a kill an egg, it doesn't show it here. Why? Any idea? Any guess? Good guess? Uh, even if it is a week plus, we should not waste time on checking the pulse uh, to start the resuscitation. Uh, to exactly. Save the exactly. So you check. Machan pulse, the you know, again. Nah, machan, nah, pulse, nah. Nah, machan, the you know. Nah, machan, nah. Right? So what will happen? You are going to waste a fair bit of time. Sometimes the patient will have very weak pulse that you might not palpate. But of course, if you are confident on whether the, if the patient has pulse, then no need to start ALS. That's quite understandable. But if the patient is not breathing normally, and if the patient is unresponsive, it says to take it as cardiac arrest. But usually for healthcare providers, we always instruct them to check for pulse and see whether if there is pulse but not breathing it is not the cardiac arrest but there is a respiratory arrest 
right so then you may bag the patient and give manual ventilation okay right but if you are not sure don't waste time on palpating the central pulse you immediately start als which include bag and valve as well <clears throat> okay we'll come to this later so how to confirm the cardiac arrest as you guys correctly said you look for the responsiveness kathagalavalno siripala 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 is not responding and you look for breathing so nowadays we don't go this closer to siripala's mouth because of the thank to covid we are maintaining little bit of 1 meter distance 1 meter i mean at least we will but carefully look whether the patient's chest is rising or not right but we don't go and feel the breath we call this look listen and feel we won't listen the breath unless we wear proper ppe but i i think now it is not necessary you don't want to get uh, infected not even covid even tb so no need to go this closer but check carefully whether the patient is breathing but at the same time this woman or this girl i would say hold on i will get my uh, oh i'm this girl is checking the pulse etakora metana balanne kohomada trachea is in the midline then you see the sternocleidomastoid here between sternocleidomastoid and the trachea you palpate for carotid pulse right whatever the central pulse which is easy for you to check the carotid pulse before that of course you need to open up the airway maybe patient is not breathing because his airway is obstructed so what they have done is they have done a little bit of chin lift right and open up the airway and check for breathing agonal breathing will be considered as cardiac arrest you all know that right then what would you do if the patient is on cardiac arrest you cannot run this show all by yourself then what you have to do is call your colleagues call for help call for help කියන්නේ මොකද්ද මේක මේ ඩ්‍රාම එක බලන්න කට්ටිය වගෙන්නනානේ මේ you ask them to bring the mighty machine that is the defibrillator as well as you might need more team to continue the resuscitation okay after that you start cpr you know it is 30s to 2 for adults you give 30 compressions then you give two breaths right always when you give breaths you stop chest compressions and allow the person who is giving breaths to give a good chest expansion mega dennan wale breaths deela wedak na make sure the patient's chest is coming up or moving or the air is going inside the lungs so that will gives a chest expansion so while you are giving chest compressions stop for 2 seconds and he, the person will give squeeze one squeeze two right so it should be 30s to 2 each compression make sure you give in the correct side the correct depth should not go more than 6 cm then what will happen you will break one or two ribs unnecessarily breaking couple of ribs by giving good quality chest compression is tolerated no problem but should not be going more than 6 cm that it will be uh, adversely affect the patient right so nearly 2 per second that is 110 per minute that is the ideal and make sure you don't interrupt or you minimally interrupt the cpr because what will happen the pressure in the root of the aorta will gradually climb up like this when you give chest compression when you stop compression it drops drastically but as soon as you start chest compression it doesn't come up to the whatever the level it slowly come up and it needs to build up over maybe 10 15 seconds right so each uh, interruption will drop the aortic root pressure right so that is why it is indicated uh, for uh, to uh, do the interruptions of course you have to do interruptions but minimize the interruptions as much as possible right etoro mokada karanne when you are tired 
you don't wait until you become tired to switch right so you get a person to wait behind you and every 2 minutes you ask the next person to switch to the uh, chest compression that's how you can avoid fatigue okay so in this situation there's only one sorry there's only two types of rhythms they are either shockable or non shockable rhythms so make sure you don't think about too much in this situation right so you get the defibrillator plug in you select the appropriate leads and once you are ready you give a little pause and you do the rhythm assessment and then you look for whether this patient is in a shockable rhythm or the patient is in non shockable rhythm eke wedak na vt the vf the af the araka the meka the you are not going to think too much in this situation right so you see whether the patient has shockable rhythm or patient has non shockable rhythm right so what are the shockable rhythms first thing is the first one is the vf you know podi ekage chitra wage it's a bizarre irregular wave form there's no recognizable qrs but little um, broad right but it just a bizarre rhythm there's no coordination it could be fine af or it could be a coarse af right so it could be little one or it could be like a coarse a sorry coarse vf like this i'm sorry so what will happen if nobody shocks this patient it will generally gradually become fine vf and then it will become a asystole or the straight kind of line <clears throat> the next one is the vt or the ventricular tachycardia this is a pulseless vt you have two types of vt one ventricular tachycardia the patient is alive patient has pulse <clears throat> but this uh shockable vt or the pulseless vt the patient is dead or the patient is not responding ideally it is a broad complex rhythm it is rapid but constant qrs morphology when it is monomorphic if it is polymorphic it is it is organized but it's not id identical to each other right so whatever it is these two are shockable rhythms so if you see either this or this you don't have to see tell whether this is a vf or a vt you simply say it is a shockable rhythm because what all you do is you shock the patient simple as that okay so how do you shock so you do the rhythm analysis now you recognize it is a shockable rhythm so you need a little bit of time to get the defibrillator charge and put gel and things like that so the meantime as i said to minimize the chest compressions you immediately start chest compressions so while continuing chest compressions so you take the oxygen away some people you know debate about this if you don't like to take the oxygen away i don't mind you don't take the oxygen away and you charge the defibrillator right while continuing chest compressions you charge the defibrillator and you apply gel on the patient once the charging is completed it will give a continuous beep sound then only you ask the patient to stop compressions or simply you say hands off and you immediately shock with a quick safety look make sure there is no one is touching the patient right but once you shock immediately you start compression like this you assess the rhythm now you know it's a shockable rhythm you restart cpr and while giving cpr you charge and once you charge you ask the patient uh, provider to take the hands off and immediately deliver the shock and you start chest compressions okay but throughout you need to minimally interrupt the chest compressions so what will happen if you continue to do this you deliver the shock you continue cpr for 2 minutes then you again check the rhythm 
if it is again shockable you give another shock but you can go for higher energy maybe i usually go for the maximum energy after the sec uh, from the second shock because i want to get the heart as fast as possible um, and once you give three shocks this is the time for you to go for adrenaline and amiodrone they all are bolusers you push 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 okay with a flash if it is an unshockable rhythm simply what you do you continue chest compression because it's a non shockable rhythm what are the shock non shockable rhythms first one is the asystole make sure it is not a straight line if it is a straight line it could be a lead disconnection right so some some um, defibrillators might give a straight line which is unlikely to be the asystole which is most likely due to a lead disconnection right so make sure the leads are connected and then reevaluate okay sometimes you see p waves only metana podi p waves chutta atarin patara podi p waves tika kenna puluwan but that again take it as asystole so the other one is the pulseless electrical activity p p kiyanne kadala right pulseless electrical activity pulseless electrical activity is if you see this ecg only you will see the patient is not dead patient should be alive but actually there is no pulse so you have the electrical activity but there is no pulse so any rhythm that that looks like a perfusing rhythm but actually there is no perfusion you take it as a pea so they all are non shockable rhythm so if you see a rhythm anything like this there's no pulse you take it as non shockable rhythm what do you do you immediately start cpr but of course you start with a adrenaline 1 mg 1 in 10000 so you dilute it up to 10 times and give a as a push iv dose so the during cpr these are the things you have to uh check or you have to uh, continue while giving cpr of course the high quality cpr we talk about rate depth and recoil and you need to plan actions before interrupting cpr so if you need to get the adrenaline now you have been sh given sh three shocks now you know actually you have given two shocks after the third shock you know now you are going to give the iv adrenaline so by the second shock ask one of your nurses to prepare the adrenaline right don't wait till you finish the three shocks so always plan things beforehand and make sure you fix the uh, the bag and valve mask to the oxygen uh, source okay sometimes when you are so uh, stress you you don't know that you haven't plug in the oxygen tube to the cylinder right so make sure you have uh, connected to the oxygen source right advanced capnography if you have it is wonderful consider advanced airway if you have a um, capable person only but otherwise it is not important for you to get an advanced airway okay it will uh, negatively affect the patient's outcome if an unskilled person attempt airway because as i said you need to ensure high quality cpr you cannot penalize high quality cpr only to stick a advance airway right chest compressions continuously you can uh, provide if you have an advance airway or the endotracheal intubation right so we have vascular access tagala nurse to kiyanone miss can you like da gana ape nurse lat nan kiyanno net na they jump on the patient and they will quickly get into the uh, cannula but make sure you instruct them to get a cannula once you start giving adrenaline you can continue it on every other cycle not every cycle okay so that means 3 to 5 minutes and make sure you correct the reversible causes we will check what are the causes that you can reverse these are 4hs and 4ts it's a mnemonic 4hs and 4ts hypoxia hyperkalemia hypothermia hypovolemia right so those are the four hs and the four t's tamponade thrombosis toxin 
and tension pneumothorax. So while you are giving chest compressions or you while you are adhering to the ALS algorithm, look for any cause that has made this patient to get a cardiac arrest, right? If the patient AI entry is reduced on one side, or if it is hyperresonant, technically it's very difficult to check for hyperresonant, resonant, hyperresonant, there's no much difference, right? So if the reduced AI entry, you suspect a trauma or maybe a spontaneous shortness of breath, you may stick a needle and release the tension. Simple as that. If the patient comes following diarrhea and vomiting, could be hypothermia, start aggressive fluid resuscitation. Trauma, same, right? Hypovolemia can cause. If you are going to appoint to the neuralia, a drunken person who was uh, stuck in a maybe a gutter or something last night could have hypothermia, but very rarely. Otherwise, the rest of the places, you might not get hypothermia in Sri Lanka. There are loads of CKD patients. You know this hyperkalemia can come with uh, chronic renal disease patients, right? So if you suspect a CKD patient, they will have a renal look. They will carry uh, uh, renal clinic notes. They might come with a vascular uh, uh, catheter, right? Where they, or they might have a AV fistula where they get uh, the dialysis. So these are the patients you suspect for them to have hyperkalemia. Patients with hypo, hypoxia would be the fever, cough, pneumonias, right? They are the patient who can die of hypoxia, right? Thrombosis is the commonest cause for the cardiac arrest. That is the myocardial infarction, right? Mostly. Oh, otherwise, it could be the pulmonary embolism, which we might rarely see. But if it is thrombosis, what you have to do is you continue the ALS, and get the patients back and then do an ECG and uh, confirm. Otherwise, if the patient is in cardiac arrest, you are not be, you will not be able to get a, or diagnose a myocardial infarction. Okay. We talked about this. Airway, airway should be secured if you are going to uh, continue it little longer. If you are going to drag ALS, then it's not going to help because the patient will die of hypoxia. You need to give optimum oxygenation as well. So if it is dragging on, make sure you arrange a secure airway, at least a supraglottic. I'm sure you must have seen a laryngeal mask airway that is equally effective um, to use and it need a minimum training. You just need to apply it as a pencil. And this is very, um, studies have shown it is equally effective as a tracheal tube, almost. Okay. So don't attempt intubation unless you are trained to do so. It will obstruct your valuable time or it will affect your valuable time, not your valuable time. It will be even patient's valuable time. Okay. Once the airway is secured, you don't have to interrupt. 30 is to 2 unknown when there's no definitive airway. When the air is definitely away, the chest compression will go at a rate of 110 independently and the ventilation will go independently at a rate of 10 to 12, right? Because the 10 to 12 is very important. You need to avoid hyperventilation, right? Capnography, if you are lucky enough to appoint as an HO with a unit, you have capnography, you can, but you will rarely be appointed. Right. So this is the post resus care. You can't go for a tea or you can't go to a canteen once the patient come back to the life. What you do is you again do what the Dr. Prashant said uh, before this lecture. So you, if the patient has pulse or patient is alive, you do ABCDE approach. If the patient is dead or patient has on cardiac arrest or patient is unresponsive, you go on the ALS algorithm, right? So it's very important for you to treat the precipitating cause. Otherwise, patient will go back to the cardiac arrest. If the patient uh, got the cardiac arrest due to hypoxia following a pneumonia, of course, you need to ventilate the patient. I mean, intubate and ventilate and optimize the ventilation to prevent 
going back to the cardiac arrest. Similarly, if the patient's cause is the hyperkalemia, make sure you take immediate action, maybe insulin dextrose, cal gluconate to stabilize the myocardium, and you arrange a uh, super urgent dialysis to reduce the potassium level, are the plans that you should come up with the post resus care, right? Generally, you need to optimize the saturation. Initially, it might technically challenging, but you should be aiming the saturation of 94 to 98. Huh? And if you have capno, wonderful. Make sure capno is around 30s, right? Don't let the capno to go beyond. It will add on to the acidosis of the patient and will have a bad outcome. Basics, 12 DCG, targeted temperature, uh, just make there is an entity called targeted temperature management, at least avoid hyperthermia. Right. So this is very important to work as a team. If you come to the emergency department, you will see we always work as a team. In the emergency department, there's no mamparajataka. If we save patients or if we kill patients, we kill them as a team or we treat them as a team, right? So team approach is very important. So providing advanced life support is a team effort. If you don't have a good team effort, you cannot get these patients back. So what are the compositions or the contents of the team? You have team players and you have a team leader. The leader should come from the team it could be the senior or the most experienced person, but the whole team should identify the leader and the decisions should come from the leader. But of course, the team players can help the team uh, leader to make the decisions, right? And of course, the non-technical skills. So the non-technical skills are how do you interact with the team? How do you know the situation? Right, what type of a patient got the cardiac arrest? What are the capabilities of my team? How I am going to interact with the team? You cannot be too arrogant. And of course, you can't. Could you please start chest compressions? No, you simply say start chest compression, right? Because this is kind of a highly dynamic and stressful condition, right? So the way you communicate, the way you understand the surrounding, the way you understand the patient, the way you understand the team with you is all matters when you run a resuscitation with your team, right? I'm sure the structured communication may have been talked about in the last lecture, but anyway, structured communication is something that you need to practice, right? So this avoid errors. So this comes with the mnemonic of S bar. S is stand for situation, B for background, A for assessment, and R for resuscitation, right? So now you may have seen many, uh, many of our colleagues when we uh, present a case, this is a 45 year of uh, mother of three children coming from uh, Siebala and came today, this morning, she came from the bus to Nuarelia and then uh, she took a taxi to um, hospital and then she felt hungry and then she went to the canteen and then she felt a little sweaty and then, but she sat down and then afterwards she complained of chest, compl uh, chest pain, but nobody was there. And then she suddenly uh, collapsed and found on the floor and then There'll be a long story going on, but what has happened? The patient had a cardiac arrest, which is out of hospital and brought to the a and &E and was resuscitated. But the person is talking about a hell of a big background rather than telling the situation. So you start with, this is the patient who had out of hospital or 32 or 56 year old man or a woman who sustained an out of hospital cardiac arrest now revived. So that is the situation. It's just like a headline of the paper, right? So you tell simply what has happened to the patient and then go to the background. She came from the CBL and the past history of ischemic heart disease and hypertension. Now today, uh, while attending to the clinic, she felt dizzy and sweaty and chest pain and blah, blah. So that is the background. And then your assessment is 
now what is the clinical situation right now she has been uh, revived uh, or the rosc as um, we got the rosc and the patient is intubated the blood pressure is this pulse blood pressure is this it comes as an airway breathing circulation right and then finally you come with your recommendation the recommendation is whether the patient needs to go to icu or the patient needs to go to the uh, um patient needs go to a reperfusion therapy or whatever it is or a urgent uh, explorative laparotomy depending on the situation okay so that is how you communicate with a structured approach so situation background assessment recommendation okay so it will be really nice if we get a separate uh, lecture for sba which i forgot actually but we'll see even in future right any question you have you can type on the chat box as well i'll give you 2 minutes right so the meantime we have discussed about the importance of high quality chest compressions because we need to minimize interruptions as well as give a good um, or even the possible uh, blood pressure to perfuse the vital organs right and there are some reversible causes and make sure you try to correct the reversible causes while providing cpr or the als because that is the way you get the patient back if there is a cause for cardiac arrest you need to treat the cause to get them back right and of course don't underestimate the team approach in a resuscitation right because it's very important for you to um, act as a team you need more people more thinking and the, simultaneously there are many things might go right and the non technical skills the way you communicate the way you understand the situation the way you understand the surrounding is all matters for a favorable patient's outcome sir will the college offer some hands on experience with cpr prior to internship ekanam harawa ella karanno ne ministry vetata para we would love to do that uh, but that will all depend on uh, the ministry's plan um, because usually how many in your group i don't know let's see other log will i know 274 that is going to be enormous number but i don't know whether the college of anesthesiologists might interest on uh, doing uh, at least a bls and a defibrillation or the bls course for you all if the ministry is facilitating i would be more than happy to uh, help uh, but i think as the college probably do within a short period to train 274 would be something uh, impossible but uh, may if the ministry is arranging it with the help of other colleges like the college of anesthesiologists it is something not impossible okay uh, so we are happy to help in that regard so now it is the tea break so after the tea break done by dr kaushila tilakasiri uh, she is one of the on her foreign training 
उदय पहाट भी तरह नगिटला Sorry, the next lecture will be done by uh, Dr. Dilan Prasinghe, huh? the sick child. He is uh, one of the uh, consultant emergency physician at uh, Teaching Hospital, Colombo South Teaching Hospital. Right. So now it is the tea break, and after the tea break, uh, Dr. Dilan will start his lecture. Okay. Thank you for listening. Dr. Ashtan, over to you.
Hello, sorry. Um, I, I want to uh, give a little message. There is a little uh, miscommunication. So uh, we have to uh, get the sick child lecture uh, to the uh, as a last lecture. But the next lecture will be the uh, to evaluation of evaluation of a patient with reduced conscious level done by the doctor Inuka Vijay Gunawadhan. He is one of the emergency physicians at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. But uh, please bear for another 5-10 minutes uh, because of this uh, swap, he might need extra 5-10 to 10 minutes to uh, fix his uh, laptop. So he will log in at least by 10.50. So please bear another 5-10 to 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. Inuka will start his lecture, the, which is uh, happened to be the last lecture, will be the next. Okay. Uh, sorry about the inconvenience.
Doctor Edipo, you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm uh, just now connected. Is Edipo mean that's you, no? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, give me a second. How can I share my screen? Is it, uh, can you can see my slide? Can you see the slide now? Yes, we can see. Yeah. You, you can see now? Yes, doctor. Shall, I, shall I start yes. the lecture? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, this lecture is based, uh, basically on patient with reduced level of consciousness. And when we are uh, getting the patient with uh, management principle as an emergency, uh, as you are, when you are entering into the house officer, at the, how you will manage in the emergency setting in this type of patient. First, some this may be some important. Uh, what is consciousness? It's a vague state in which one with ability to stimuli, interact, and some wakefulness and alert other things. This means conscious awareness, the perception, very attain language, and more looking for. But the first one is to wake openness, open eye, death. The conscious may depend on the
Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear. The computer, yes, you have to mute, then there is, won't be echoing. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Now it's clear. Yeah, can you hear? Can you hear now? Yeah. Yeah. You can see my slide as well. Shall I proceed? You have to share the slides, Dr. Inuka. We are not seeing the slides. Okay. okay. Okay, I will share screen again. Okay. Can you see now? Yes. Just make table editing on the top. Yes, sir. No, not that. There's enable editing on the top. Protect view without the car party with it. Table. Yeah, then make it full screen. It will come. Hey, yellow icon. Oh, then enable edit card. Nigga. Just press it. Hmm? Yeah, just press it. Can you share? No, it's already sharing. Okay. Once you don't do editing, enable editing, it doesn't become ah, right. full screen. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. Right. Now, now okay. yeah, now you go to full screen on the bottom. Uh, uh, full, full screen. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Excellent. Yes. Thank okay. you. Right. Okay. okay. Um, we'll start from the beginning again. Uh, patient with uh, reduced level of consciousness. Uh, how uh, going to manage this type of patient when come to the emergency? Uh, just simply briefly describe the defini uh, definition. What is consciousness? This consciousness is mainly have two parts. One thing is the wakefulness, and other thing is conscious awareness. And this two part is basically compound uh, in all in our brain is ascending reticular activating system and the cerebral cortex. If see one of these uh, structure is getting lesion and you will uh, end up with the loss of consciousness. Therefore, it's, uh, and the most important thing is uh, when you get in the cerebral cortex, you, the whole, both two cerebral cortex should be involved when you patient and get a, a reduced level of consciousness. And uh, a little bit uh, small definition regarding three parts, but in like coma, the stupor, and the vegetative state. This is more, not much important in the emergency, but uh, when your patient came with a chronic patient, uh, uh, when you are having some brain lesion or something, and they mention those terms, therefore it is important to just uh, aware of what is this concept is. So what a coma, in coma situation, this patient is completely unarousable, unaware, and complete inability to respond meaningful to external stimuli. And uh, it means patient can breathe, Patient uh, vital is maintaining, but patient is completely like not responding, not aware, and no meaningful sense. This GCS is completely like three. And the stupor is a little bit different from the coma. It, they, they will respond some repeated stimuli, will arouse the patient. That is the only difference between the coma and stupor. This, otherwise, the, both. Uh, uh, condition now almost similar, but it's too far just with the vigorous stimuli, patient will be can get around. And the vegetative state is patient is completely uh, uh, loss of awareness with perceived uh, awakefulness and the sleep fake cycle. You can say this, this vegetative state is a chronic state, basically, not in the acute setting. They maintain their sleep wake cycle and the, they will preserve awake 
wakefulness, but it's not able to communicate or anything. It's just a simple, uh, like a dead body, but it's just breathing and again, the sleep wakes like this. Basically, due to hypoglycemia, anoxia, uh, following ischemic uh, uh, event, following cardiac arrest, due to axonal injury, following a traumatic brain injury, the structural lesion, such as a tumor or stroke. And how do how do you approach uh, this uh, this type of patient presented with to our emergency department ward? Is it when we considering patient with loss of consciousness, no need to go behind what what is your diagnosis? First, we need to initially stabilize the patient first of all, and then, then need to work up. And it's the concept called the common net. Approach is a blueprint. This blueprint approach is we can apply for everything like chest pain, shortness of breathing, uh, fever, whatever. And this the same thing applies to our uh, patient with reduced level of consciousness. Blueprint is a basic structure. The everything uh, uh, derived from that basic structure. There's a blueprint here. They, they are, it is a common thing we always follow it is the uh, these uh, things are triage initial stabilization directed history and examination from in session just uh, we can briefly describe in a few slides how i going to approach uh, with the blueprint uh, the patient with reduced level of consciousness and the triage actually this triage we can say this reduced level of consciousness is yeah, this is less than eight most of the time. The risk of airway patency uh, is going to be critically affected. Therefore, it should, most of the time it can be category one patient. It should be seen immediately. And initial stabilization with the A, B, C, D, E manner. And patient with reduced level of consciousness, you know, definitely patient tongues are fallen back already and uh, patient airway can immediately compromise and therefore we can keep the patient in uh, recovery position or in the event in the emergency so keeping supine position is uh, okay because we have already uh, our staff is there we can prevent the aspiration in case therefore in the supine position in the emergency department and the uh, uh, resuscitation room is accepted and also then give oxygen, then open the airway and set the patency and use the airway opening manual and the airway agent uh, using those things uh, we can first stabilize the airway. And the cervical spine stabilization also a little bit important, but uh, uh, it's basically in the trauma setting. And just a simple airway manual, head tilt, chin lift and the jaw thrust. And the airway adjunct, oropharyngeal airway, and the nasopharyngeal airway. And then we, we need to look for breathing effort, the respiratory rate, how this is the tachycnic or any respiratory distress, and uh, other lung signs or saturation here. Because it's in sometimes the hypoxia itself can le lead to patient unconscious. We need to clearly see whether it's not, the patient is not hypoxic or not. That's just, the, when you checking methodically, when the breathing part, we, so we can clearly see, uh, we can clearly check whether the patient is hypoxic or not. Then we can get a clear, uh, can rule out the hypoxia is not a cause for this patient uh, with a loss, uh, reduced level of consciousness. And then the circulation is basically hypotension, and tachyarrhythmia or something is related to the reduced level of consciousness, we need to assess. And then we immediately need to put IV access and we need if any IV fluid and take a blood sugar and the venous blood gas and electrolyte and basic uh, other blood for investigation in the circulation. And in the disability part, basically we can check the GCS score with the, because it's basically important important whether we need to uh, see whether the patient need intubation early or we need to let remember the GPS early. You can uh, use your smartphone and now with a lot of apps is there, usually M M MedCal, MDCal, you can go to the MDCal, check the GCS and 
uh, check uh, the GCS value just clearly and see what is the GCS. It's usually GCS less than eight, and whether whether we need to intubate this patient or not, uh, make a decision and this. And also, we need to check the pupil response and the body habit, like is a decorticate uh, decerebrality or like. And the ex then exposure, exposure to the rash, trauma, and then a wound and everything. And then we check, measure the blood sugar uh, and the temperature and the ECG and the blood gases and basically acid. Uh, acid base level, hypoxia or hypocapnia, and the electrolyte, especially sodium, and this hyponatremia can cause the reduced level of consciousness is the important. And then uh, we can get a directed history and examination. <clears throat> and most of the time, uh, the history is not readily available because the patient is unconscious and uh, unwitness uh, most of the time. And then we need to take uh, for, uh, collateral history and uh, most of the time it's not available even. This is the alcohol or drug or fever history, trauma history. It's something we, we need to get, uh, take from the what, whatever the eyewitness. And head to toe examination and the available uh, other toxidrome features, uh, yeah, the poisoning is maybe a possibility. And then uh, we need to come in specific treatment for this, uh, this type of patient. And if you have hypoglycemia, then we can treat the glucose. And this is in case of opioid, uh, like morphine, then we can the trial of naloxone and some antidote uh, uh, for we, uh, some, uh, like uh, you can just say uh, organophosphate poisoning, the atropine or like something. And then uh, further imaging is need to do. And ongoing care is basically admit to the appropriate area uh, and maybe ICU, a neurosurgical ward or neurology ward or general ward with the HDU facility. Maybe need to uh, do the ready site uh, with the ongoing treatment. And basically this uh, course of reduced level of consciousness uh, need to uh, decided uh, Gradual, this is later, not after approaching A, B, C, D manner, then we need to think about what is will be the course. And basically, few courses is, is structural, metabolic, infectious, and the toxic, and sometimes coma maybe. Those are the basic uh, the div uh, division of uh, what is the courses, what are the courses for reduced level of consciousness. And the structural abnormality like uh, ICH, SCH, and massive brain lesion. And uh, you can, when you see the structural abnormality like ICH, you can see the agonal breathe, breathing pattern like pushing reflexes, if you getting high, like bradycardia, hypertension, and the un unequal pupil, and the, some features like uh, unilateral weakness. Those things are most common clinical signs and symptoms. So, uh, structural abnormality and the metabolic wise and basically blood sugar and uh, it look like the hypoadrenalism like Addison and the hyponatremia forces uh, a lot of forces for hyponatremia those things can cause a uh, reduced level of consciousness and the infectious cause is the most First, we neglect those things for most of the time because we don't know whether we have fever or not, but we have nuclear rigidity and history of seizure and the temperature is high or not, uh, high. Sometimes even with the ICH and cerebral pathology, temperature autoregulation is going to upset and the temperature is low or high. We can't exactly decide which of this background whether it is the infection or not, but in clearly uh, sometimes uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage so nuclear rigidity why right? not uh, uh, not like uh, the infection but in that case also we have some clear uh, basic understanding whether he has meningitis or lung this basically clinical journey and the toxic several toxic uh, things uh, can cause the reduced level of consciousness the sympathomimetic, anticholinergic, tricyclic, 
and uh, organophosphate uh, and uh, alcohol essentially or and hydrocarbon those things are there and uh, next thing is Hello.
Dr. Kausali, are you there? There is a small uh, technical error finding with Dr. Nuka. So, Dr. Inuka has a connection problem. So, Dr. Kaushalya Tilakasiri will join uh, to do the lecture, next lecture. So, uh, that's on. Uh, Trauma and resuscitation. So she'll join them.
Hello. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Kaushal, you can start. Good morning, Dr. Kaushal. You can start. We have given in instruction, instruction already. Yeah. So I think you can hear me, but I don't yeah. know because I get I have got no response from no. your side, uh, despite there are two hundred and thirty six. Uh, so I'm not sure whether my mic is even working. But anyway, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear? Your mic is Hello? working. Okay, yeah, good. I yeah, can right. hear now. Okay. You're good to go. Yeah. I think, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, I think I was mute. I had my uh, speaker mute. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a discussion. This is not a straightforward lecture. Uh, so how, how long do I have to talk? Uh, you have 45 minutes now. Okay. That's a lot. Um, uh, so I need the participants to get, you know, talk and tell me what you oh, think. Sorry, now you have Otherwise, only 30. 30 minutes. Okay. So yeah. that's that's fine. Um, uh, but I need participants to talk. Yeah, so it is, it's okay. Time is not a factor. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not going to progress if you don't talk. So um, I'm not going to ask anybody by name. It will be very threatening, but uh, uh, try to talk. And, and there's no wrong answer in this. And I mean, it's a process of learning and nobody's going to die if you give a wrong answer here. But if you stay quiet and not ask, and I also get things for granted, like, oh, you know this, and why should I teach you this? Then, then somebody will die someday. So, so ask questions and clarify. Uh, okay, so oh, trauma resuscitation is the topic, and it's a very broad topic. So, I have tried to bring you a case which will tell you uh, most of the things that are important as an intern medical officer. So, the the objectives of this would be to be able to explain the importance of preparation prior to a trauma patient arrival. So you might be working in setups, you will have that kind of opportunity and therefore I thought this is also important. And evaluate the mechanism of injury to determine the patient's potential injuries. So uh, it's important in trauma, unlike uh, you know other diseases, we look at signs and symptoms and think this patient might be having this disease like that. Trauma is a disease entity by itself. and you need to be able to think what potential injuries a patient might have. Identify the correct sequence of priorities for the assessment of a multiple injured patient. And then apply the principles of primary and secondary survey to assessment of multiple injured patient. Then discuss the importance of re-evaluating a patient who is in who is not responding appropriately to initial resuscitation and management, and then recognize patients who require transfer to another facility for definitive care. So uh, from an intern perspective, this is the uh, outline of resuscitation of trauma. Uh, however, if you have any other questions, you can ask at any time, raise your hand, and you know how to raise hand in Zoom, so you can ask, or even just switch on your mic and ask. Right. Um, okay. 
so we are going to talk about a case scenario which will progress as you answer things. So this is an 18 year old male who has who was unrestrained driver in a motor vehicle which crashed onto a tree. So you can see the image. Um, uh, a tree. Uh, so so ignore the non reported. Vitals not reported. Uh, prolonged restriction. So transported to emergency by ambulance. Initial vitals were not reported. So oxygen by mask given and fluid via single IV line was started. Spinal board restriction on a long spine board was done. So how would you prepare for the arrival of this patient? Now, assume that you are getting a call uh, from the police or from the 1990 ambulance service. Um, and now there is a system in Sri Lanka where most of the emergency physicians are working. We have a network of um, through the 1990 where we get information about this kind of uh, uh, significant patients uh, to the ED consultant. And, and the consultant says he's, he's on his way uh, and to the ED. Meanwhile, you are in the fl floor trying to prepare stuff. So what, what would you get ready with? Anyone can answer. Come on. Okay, how would you prepare the arrival of a patient with trauma? If I simplify it, what stuff do you need? Okay, if you don't answer, then I'll just close this uh, presentation and go. That's it. I'm not going to progress anymore. There's no point in having a discussion with you if you don't answer. You, we can't have a discussion <laughs> with somebody who doesn't answer. It just reminds me of a psychiatric patient who doesn't want to talk. <laughs> Call for help. Okay, right. So help is on the way, but what would you prepare in the floor? So, so you have done five years of medical training and you are getting a major trauma patient now. What do you want to have? Yes, other staff members. Okay, so if you have a formal trauma call to make, then you can do that. That is, you have previously arranged team that you can call which includes possibly an assertist, um, trauma, uh, a surgeon and um, blood bank you might need to call these persons but um, yes in, in, in terms of equipment so somebody has mentioned adjuncts for ABC so we don't call them really adjuncts they are actually AB, uh, the equipment that needs to manage ABCD um, Yes, a spinal board. He's already on spinal board and so he's not on collar, but yes, good collar. So you you can have an emergency trolley. If you have an emergency trolley, then that can be told straight away. Yes, equipment for intubation, IV fluid, order blood products. So I don't know if we need blood products at this stage, but just inform the blood bank that you might need. Resuscitation team, trolley need to be ready, even a collar. Okay, so... I, I don't know why you don't switch on the mic and talk, 
then nobody is going to find a error in you or in your answer please switch on the mic and talk i don't like to be the only person talking uh inform theater yes if theater might be needed so we might need to inform theater okay so you will need equipment to assess and treat problems in airway breathing circulation disability and exposure so what other information would be helpful to know in order to prepare so what what information if you can get would you like to know come on switch on the mic and answer inga inga somebody accidentally switched on the mic <laughs> uh what kind of injuries he has had got and any fractures and the mechanism of injury yes very good so the mechanism we know which is a uh, unrestrained driver hitting on a tree very good you can ask what injuries he has so and then you also can ask the vitals if it was not reported but you can ask them again if, if you can get some vital signs so if there is a mnemonic for this it's called mist it stands for mechanism m i for injuries s for signs and symptoms that is your vital signs and then t for treatment treatment given on the way so those are the and gather okay from the history what are the potential injuries to this patient that this patient might have suffered what do you think a car spinal injury. cord injuries spinal Pardon? cord injury fractures yes, spinal cord injuries uh, external wounds external wounds like what like massive hemorrhage mm -hmm. yeah um, can, can have head head injury. Injury. sorry can have head injuries while yes, head injury. yeah what else liver laceration and yes so this kind of a patient can actually have any injury right but uh, uh, but you have to look for injuries that can kill Do you know any injuries that can kill patients immediately if not treated pneumothorax yes tension pneumothorax yes five life threatening injuries what are the five life threatening injuries you know sorry So, sorry, I can't hear you. Massive hemothorax. Yes, massive hemothorax. Pardon? Tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, flail chest, yes. If you switch on the mic and tell, then things are much quicker. I don't even know who's going to talk because I can't see that window. I've, I've closed the images so you don't have to worry at all just switch on the mic and tell monaki mona verdi dak yuwa kavur gwa dak dannet nai inda kiyanna bay nathu okay so we move forward so you can actually sustain any injury in this patient but as you correctly said you had to look for major injuries and how do you look for major injuries is the next question that we are going to answer okay so um ambulance trans we got another report from the ambulance so ambulance reports patient is lethargic mumbling unintelligibly patient has facial injuries and vital signs are reported as heart rate 120 blood pressure 90 by 40 respiratory rate 24 oxygen saturation 89 temperature 36 right patient arrives at hospital with these vitals and the saturation has now dropped to 82 with a temperature of 35.5 uh 
systole is 90 but diastole is not palpable just palpable but not recorded respiratory rate 20. what are your clinical cornerstones so what is the cornerstone of trauma patient management or resuscitation So patient is right in front of you now, you are the intern, you have one nursing officer with you, you have one attendant with you. Let's say you get this patient at 10 p.m. Usually the ward is, you wouldn't have much support at that time. Until you get further to report, how are you going to start? Yes, according to ATLS protocol, A, B, C, D, E assessment. Very good. So, ABCD assessment, what do we mean by that? It is also called the primary survey. So, how do we do that? Hmm. Okay. In other words, how do we start primary survey? You simply talk to the patient and see if he can talk or not. And if he can talk, it yes. means the RV and breathing is patent. Yes, that's a very good answer. So there is a method of assessing primary survey A, B, C and D, but not E, with, with within 10 seconds. That is by just talking to the patient and asking what happened. So if the patient can talk, it does not only tell you that AV is patent. If the patient can talk rationally, and give you a rational answer that tells their brain is perfusing. So it will also tell you that their circulation is good. And uh, uh, as in it perfuses the brain, right? So that's a very good way of starting. And then you have to look for um, if the patient is talking, yes, they are always patent. But given facial injuries, you have to look for potential. That means is there impending airway obstruction? Is this patient going to go into airway obstruction in the next uh, half an hour or five minutes or 10 minutes? So, so that's one thing. And then um, now we have talked to the patient. Patient doesn't talk back. So with these vitals mumbling. Now what, how do we look, what do we look for? So patient came on a spinal board, but ATLS starts with a cervical immobilization. So if the patient is not on a cervical collar, yes, cervical injuries can be there. So see spine immobilization. Now we call it cervical motion restriction. So we do, we can do that just by keep, keeping two blocks on either sides and strapping the blocks to the patient. You don't necessarily have to have a collar unless you have found cervical in injuries, spine injuries now. So you can put a put two blocks and immobilize the head uh, and then start your primary service. So primary service starts with airway, as you said, by talking to the patient. If the patient does not talk, then you look, listen and feel for airway patency. And then for breathing, what do we, what do, we do to check breathing? look listen and feel yeah uh, that's mostly airway so breathing uh, breathing has actually inspection palpation percussion and auscultation that is the order we do but we don't do everything in the in 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 you know respiratory examination but we prioritize and do some of the things so look for res look for respiratory rate and um, chest expansion whether it's equal on either side actually chest expansion inadequate in one side is a very good feature to identify pneumothorax hemothorax so if you see unequal chest expansion that that patient definitely has something on chest x-ray so um, uh, even if he's hemodynamically stable so the other thing is you look for the trachea by palpation, trachea central or deviated to one side and then you go for percussion percussion note and also auscultate and see for AI entry. So that's how we look for breathing. And breathing assessment ends with saturation. 
so saturation is 82 in this patient uh, so definitely what could be this patient having does he have a problem with the uh, airway so he's mumbling right he could and he has facial injuries he could and then what about breathing could he be having a problem with breathing hmm. yes so um you got to switch on the mic and answer just i'm sure everyone knows the answers for these things it's not a high five thing yeah saturation is low so he he must be having a problem with breathing and then we are going to move on to circulation so how do we assess circulation in fact some of you all i might have taught in ragam and nhsl this same thing for final year medical student i have taught this Okay, so what do you look in circulation? Uh, you attach the patient to the cardiac monitor and check whether the patient's blood pressure and uh, if the patient's uh, pulse rate is high or not. If, if the patient is tachycardic and blood pressure is low, it means patient has internal or external bleeding. Yeah, that's one thing. And you you also, you attach to the monitor, yes, but pulse is something you palpate because it will tell you what volume they have. So it's important to check central and peripheral pulse with your hand and uh, blood pressure, yes. There's also a very important thing called capillary refill time and how warm the patient is, how cold the patient is. If the patient is profoundly in shock like this patient with 90 blood pressure systole, then you would see it on blood pressure. But blood pressure, remember, is a very late sign. So tachycardia is a very good sign. Say this patient came with 120, 80 blood pressure, but the tachycardia was 110 and peripheries were cold or to touch. Then this patient is going into shock, but he's at this moment being compensated by his high heart rate so be aware when you look for blood pressure and determine a patient is having a circulation problem or not in trauma it's especially in trauma because usually trauma patients are young healthy adults and they compensate very well so yes circulation has one part to do with heart rate blood pressure Periphery is warm or not, capillary refill time. And that's another very important thing. What is that? Other than checking your blood pressure and looking at the monitor, you also need to look at the patient and find whether there are major bleeding sites. Can anyone name the major bleeding sites? Liver laceration. Pardon? Yes, liver laceration. So where is the liver in the human body? Right, upper quadrant. Yeah, it's in the abdominal cavity, right? Okay, so intra-abdominal bleeding. Then culling keyword awake hemothorax, right? So chest, chest, abdomen, pelvis, long bones. Uh, so there is a mnemonic called the one on the flow and uh, yeah. FOMO. So the external yeah. bleeding, intrathoracic, intraperitoneal. And pelvic mm -hmm. and retroperitoneum and uh, long bones. Yeah, so that's the four. And one more flow. Flow can be external ble injuries which may cause bleeding. Like even a scalp laceration can have a ma major bleed at the site. By the time that patient comes to the hospital, it may have clotted and it may look all right. So it's important to ask the ambulance if there was a bleeding at the site, a major bleed what amount of blood was lost in the site, right? Uh, they may have controlled the bleeding by applying direct pressure and packs and everything, but they may have, a, have had a major bleed on the flow. Right, so you look for this and then D. D disability, what do you look for in disability? Hmm? 
uh, you check for head injuries, uh, GCS, pupil yeah. reaction, and consciousness level. Okay, so uh, you look for GCS, you look for conscious level, and you also look for pupils, right? Uh, glucose level. Yes, you are correct. So anything else in D that you, if the patient is talking, now this patient is not talking, so obviously the GCS is going to be somewhere below it. And uh, this patient, it's very important to know the GCS because if he improves or deteriorates, that will help us objectively find that as well. And uh, Capillary blood sugar. Anything else? Sorry? Capillary blood sugar. sugar yeah, blood sugar, GCS, PO pills, anything else? So obvious neurology. If there's any, you know, the patient is not moving his leg or arm, any obvious neurology, right? Uh, okay, then in exposure, what do we look for? Temperature and uh, sorry, yeah, go on. Temperature and any visible external traumatic injuries. Yes. Uh, so in exposure, that how do you expose? So you take a scissor and cut off the clothes and remove all the clothes. That's that's how we expose. Um, at least here, and uh, and that is how we expose in accident service. If you have seen, so you cut the clothes and expose completely because there might be hidden injuries, uh, and it will give you valuable information. Uh, not only penetrating injuries, the bleeding injuries, but also blunt trauma, which shows bruising on sides, which you may otherwise miss. Right. Um, so. That's one thing. And then you have to log roll and see the back. So there can be injuries in the back and patient looks fine from the front, but there are injuries in the back. Uh, not only spinal injuries, but back injuries can cause splenic lacerations, liver lacerations, even um, uh, hemoneumothorax. So it's important to look for the back, not just the spine. So if you log roll, you look for the spine as well and do the rectal examination. It is done to find if they have good anal tone. Uh, we no longer look for high riding prostate and blood. It's nest if it, if there is blood, obviously it is important. But it is done to look for anal tone. Right. So that's about it. Then what are your management priorities? So again, management priorities come under A, B, C, D, E. Does anyone know why it comes under ABCD order? Management priorities. Hmm? Is it because it's easy to remember? Depending on what can kill the patient first. Yeah, so, so that they have found with research that you can kill someone if their airway is blocked before their breathing problem. So circulation comes next and so on, right? The intracranial hemorrhage will not kill before airway problem, but someone who is having an intracranial problem with a low GCS can have an airway problem because of this low GCS, right? So if they have an airway problem because of this low GCS, before taking them to the theater to evacuate the EDH, we have to manage the airway and then take the patient to the theater. Okay, so that's that's what the management rationale is. Mm. Yeah. So when you get um, when you get to the management, the dif the the difference of other patient management, as in non-trauma patient management, and this is you manage as you find. So when you look for the airway, and if you see that patient cannot talk and there is blood in the mouth or anything like that that impairs breathing uh, impairs airway airway um, patency then you address it then and there so you start from basic airway pro management uh, so if i go to this airway it's going to be like going through one branch of a tree so um, i'm not going to go in that way because this is this is more like an introduction to trauma resuscitation. And then um, if you are really interested, you can do ATLS, which is a quite expensive one. 
if you if you want to do learn more about trauma resuscitation then i would advise you to go to um one of those courses where they teach uh, particularly this so like atls in tmc and we also do the college of emergency physicians also do some of the courses like emergency life support so if you do one of those courses you will get a better thorough knowledge uh, this is just the introduction so i won't go into detail of airway management then next comes breathing so whenever you find some problem like pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax you have to treat it then and there and then move to the next level but having said that if you have a team like if you're not the only one who is in the flow then while you look for problems in b another person can be addressing the airway a likewise so if so if there if you have an additional nurse to help you then they can be taking a cannula in and managing the circulation by starting fluid while you assess the d so that's called the horizontal approach but if you are the single person there then you do one by one and then you treat as you find right so that is how you determine the management priorities okay so this patient obvious facial trauma has obvious facial trauma mumbling incoherently decreased breath sounds on left chest no visible neck veins minimum bleeding open left femur fracture left chest bruising possible pelvic fracture localized to pain with upper extremities moans to painful stimuli does not open eyes okay right so can someone tell me the gcs of this patient with this information So localizes to pain with upper extremities. What is the GCS uh, parameter we can t tell here? Tagala Google kala balla kyan? So in your trauma way, you should have a um, GCS chart, which helps you to tell the GCS really quickly. Any idea what his GCS is? Hatai. So when you're telling GCS, tell E, V, and M. E is eye opening. So eye opening one does not open nice. V, verbal response moans to painful stimuli. That's more like incomprehensible sounds. So two, two nine. Then localizing pain, that's five. Two nine pi attack. So this is more like eight. Yeah, good. Okay, so. Patient intubated um, because he had facial injuries and his GCS is low. Uh, so intubated, femur fracture reduced with immobilizing pelvic stabilization device, 500 ml warm crystal is one unit given and vital signs improve to this. Uh, patient begins to respond to verbal stimuli, open size and tries to brush away your hand. What additional adjunct treatment would you order at this time? Oops. So tell me adjuncts of uh, primary survey. This is what adjuncts are. So somebody mentioned adjuncts to ABCD. So we don't call them adjuncts actually. It's technically wrong to tell that. It is ABCD management and then adjuncts. Okay, anything else you want to do after primary survey? That's what adjuncts mean. Uh, we can do uh, ECG monitoring. Yes, pulse very good. ECG. 
Uh, yes, pulse oximeter. oximeter actually comes in ATLS as an adjunct, but uh, having said that, it's a very, you know, a pulse oximeter as an adjunct is, is sort of weird to say outside, but you can mm -hmm. say it as an adjunct, it actually comes in B anyway. Capnography, initiative, catheters. Capnography. You mean carbon dioxide, ETCO2. Okay, yeah, ETCO2. Uh, then, uh, yes, catheterization. Good. Anything else? Can in this patient, sorry, fast, fast, okay. scan. fast scan. Fast scan is part of circulation. If you are able to do fast scan, you do it at C to detect those uh, bleeding manifestations we discuss. Uh, x-rays yes x-rays come under junks for primary survey what are the x-rays you like to have uh, chest uh, ap and uh, c spine and pelvic p yeah so now we only do chest and pelvis x-rays c spine we don't do x-rays anymore as part of primary survey adjuncts so see x-rays for c-spine is actually out now if you want to see the c-spine you do a ct c-spine otherwise don't bother uh, doing x-rays but if you're in a even if you're in a in a center where there's poor resources if you think there is a c-spine injury then you need to transfer that patient to a place that has ct uh, because your x-ray is not going to be helpful uh, it may miss and also it will delay uh, management so see so spine x-rays we don't do anymore for major for trauma uh, if you look at the nice guideline there is one indication for c, c spine x-ray just have a look at that it's like indication so you don't do that anymore okay but trauma trauma series of x-ray is chest and pelvis right uh, then that's the adjunct uh, one the one thing that we didn't talk about adjuncts is the orogastric or the nasogastric tube if the patient has nasal bleeding then you go for orogastric tube if you suspect uh, base of skull fracture you go for oro orogastric tube um, it's an important uh, adjunct in trauma uh, to empty the uh, you know if there's any gastric uh, con con gastric blood swallowed uh, it's important to empty that and as well as uh, there can be gastric, um, you know, mortality reduced and patient can vomit and aspirate. They, those things can be reduced by inserting NG in trauma. So NG in trauma is an important thing that most people forget. Um, when should the transfer occur and what tests are necessary before transferring the patient? So does this, now if, you, if this patient came to a place where does we don't have uh, neurosurgery then we will need to transfer this patient right uh, so when do you transfer a patient at what stage of management are we now ready to transfer when the patient is still yeah Okay, when the patient is stable, right? So uh, primary survey and initial stabilization, once you have done the adjuncts, you actually can transfer the patient. Uh, so he's breathing bilaterally well now and patient patient's loss of consciousness has reduced. Patient opens his eyes to pressure and moves away from stimulus. Uh, heart rate is 100, blood pressure 100 by 60, respirated. But remember, you will not be able to normalize the patient, right? So you can stabilize, but you're not going to normalize. Don't wait. I mean, you, you can't obviously improve his GCS to normal. You will not improve his blood pressure to normal. He's, it's not going to not be normalized, but it's just going to be stable. Um, and... You, you you can do a secondary survey before transferring uh, 
because you might have missed some injuries like this person is having a uh, what? Uh, yeah he has a left hemotymponium large ecchymosis left anterior chest abdominal soft tissue non distended so the hemotymponium may have been missed if you don't look so how do you do a secondary survey is the next question Um, so we uh, after finishing the primary survey that uh, we have to start the secondary survey by hepatoevision and uh, yeah. we have to examine the each region of the body and take in the Yeah, so secondary survey starts with history. Very good, somebody mentioned that. Anyone can tell me what, what is the mnemonic for that history? Ample, ample history? Ample history, yes. So you asked for uh, allergies, mechanics, uh, mechanics, medical history, past medical history. Uh, medications patient is taking, last meal and event, right? So ample history and then you look from head to toe. So head to toe examination, it's very important to expose. Don't examine with clothes and you start by, you know, going through the head. You have to literally palpate the head, go like that and then have the horoscope look into the ear. That's why they found the left hemotymponium touch the face, see the bony depressions. It's very important to literally touch the patient and see if there's any crepitus, which you can only feel by touching. So you will not see this, but you will feel. And when you touch the chest, palpate the chest and see if there's um, subcutaneous emphysema. This is a very important sign. If you don't do that, you, you can easily miss a, a small pneumothorax. Uh, so you do thorough touch and look and use all your sensors to look for other missed injuries. So if you haven't log rolled already, log rolling can be a part of the secondary survey also. But if you have log rolled, you don't need to do it again. Okay, so you do this and then abdomen palpation, then pelvis, then long bones again, touch and see each joint if there's any injury you might have overlooked especially when the patient has reduced conscious level they can't tell you i have a pain on my right ankle or whatever so you have to look inch by inch that is secondary sir then uh, what is your first step with when the patient's condition changes now if the patient blood pressure reduced now from what you had or heart rate increase what would you do You start from the very beginning, A, B, C. Yes, you start from A, B, C. You start from A. Start the primary survey again. So that is reassessing. It's very important to reassess a trauma patient. One, one incident where you would reassess is if their parameters change. Even if their parameters do not change, you do need to reassess the patient from time to time. Uh, just to make, make sure that they are not deteriorating. So this is very dynamic, so it's important to reassess. Uh, so no neurosurgery on your side. Decision was made to transfer the patient to definitive facility. Contact with the family to give the update and obtain consent for transfer. The family insists on obtaining a CT of the head, even though this will significantly delay transport. The team is ready to take the patient. Do you agree and why? You are in, uh, let's say you are in Kalutara, uh, maybe? And Kalutara has neurosurgery, probably. I don't know. Uh, let's say you are in Vaunia. You're going to transfer to Anuradhapura. Uh, so, what do you want to do?
ਨਾਈ ਦਾਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਚੈਟ ਬਾਕਸ ਕੀ ਵੜਨ ਦੇ ਮਟ ਕਿਹੰਦ ਕਟਰ ਨੇ ਯੂ ਐਸ ਅਗਰੀ ਫੋਰ ਦੀ ਐਥਿਕਲ ਰੀਸਨਸ ਐਂਡ ਲੀਗਲ ਰੀਸਨਸ ਯੂ ਐਗਰੀ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਆਫ ਲੀਗਲ ਰੀਸਨਸ ਓਕੇ ਐਨੀ ਅਦਰ ਥੋਟਸ ਤੇ ਐਂਬੂਲੈਂਸ ਇਹ ਗਈ ਲਾ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਦਾਨ ਨੇ ਅਨਾ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਹਾਂ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਡਿਸਕਸਡ ਵਿਦ ਨਿਊਰੋ ਸਰਜਰੀ ਦੇ ਹੈਵ ਅਗਰੀਡ ਟੂ ਟੇਕ ਓਵਰ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਜਸਟ ਅਬਾਊਟ ਟੂ ਪੁੱਟ ਦ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਇਨਟੂ ਦ ਐਂਬੂਲੈਂਸ ਸੋ ਨੋ ਰਾਈਟ ਦ ਆਨਸਰ ਇਜ਼ ਨੋ ਯੂ ਡੋਨਟ ਡੂ ਸੀਟੀ ਰੀਜ਼ਨ ਇਜ਼ ਇਟਸ ਨਾਟ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਚੇਂਜ ਯਰ ਮੈਨੇਜਮੈਂਟ ਸੋ ਇਟ ਵਿਲ ਓਨਲੀ ਡਿਲੇ ਦ ਟ੍ਰਾਂਸਫਰ ਯਸ ਥਿਸ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਨੀਡਸ ਅ ਸੀਟੀ ਹੈਡ ਐਂਡ doing the seat you do a ct head you don't see anything does that going to change your management you have already agreed with the neurotrauma surgeons and if they are ready to transfer then you you send the patient right but uh, if they have if the if the management changes with this so for example neurosurgery says without a ct we are not going to take the patient then yes you do a ct right so that's that's the incident where your management changes so in our setup most of the time if you have a ct facility in the hospital they will ask you to take the ct and why by toss and the image by whatsapp or whatever and then they have a look at that then they decide to transfer or not so in that case yes you do a ct but if your management in the station is not going to change by uh, imaging then you don't do that imaging that's the um, atls teaching so so the patient the family can tell yes do the ct and send but you have to explain them that it's not going to change anything it will only delay their transport and usually facilities with uh, neurotrauma uh, neurosurgery have better access to ct and better access to uh, other imaging so it's better to transfer faster than keeping the patient there and you know increasing the edh and deteriorating further okay so uh what information should you provide to the receiving facility so what are you going to tell them now we are going to take a call and tell that side uh medical officer who is going to be in the etu that you are going to transfer a patient so what are you going to tell hmm ithi katha karanne atta i have to finish this this now don't talk then that's it that question is going to be gone yes s ba somebody type i ba uh longing ya s ba right so s is for situation so when you take the call i i stands for actually introduction so you take the call and tell am i speaking to the medical officer of the etu at andradapura teaching hospital then they say yes then I am the medical officer or I am the intern medical officer from Baunia District General Hospital. Um this is to refer you this is to re, this is to give you information about a patient we are about to transfer. So that's your introduction. Then situation is this this is a patient who has had a collision with a uh, a, a car collided with a tree and presenting with low GCS. So that's your situation. Then you go and tell further details. of um s ba background so background you can tell how this patient was extricated and then how the patient was brought by the ambulance and with they gave fluid and then um uh, what vital c had on arrival and then what you have done and then what what vital patient has now comes under the assessment s ba situation background assessment assessment is your current vital signs or what what has been improved and then r is by r recommendation so i want to transfer this patient to your facility i have already discussed with the neurosurgery team we are going to send this patient and estimated time of arrival will be this are you happy to take over this patient is there anything else you want us to do before we send the patient right so that's your s bar and right then the patient is transferred to trauma center and goes to surgery for evacuation of intracranial hematoma so few more things i just need to remind you if the patient had bleeding there there is something called permissive hypotension or um uh, so 
where you don't give overly overly you don't make the patient more you know more than needed blood pressure so that's that's a concept that you can go and have a read on permissive hypotension uh, and there's another important concept called massive transfusion protocol which i didn't go into de into detail in this discussion because it will make this out of the scope so it's another concept you can go and read massive transfusion protocol where you do it and why you do it sort of things you will come across this when you start practicing so good to know and then there is another uh, important thing in trauma if you find major bleeds that is giving tranexamic so intracranial hemorrhage patients also has a place for tranexamic uh read about that know a little bit about when to give tranexamic and how to give tranexamic for trauma patients these are critical uh, management points that if patient has major bleeding right okay so any questions anything you want to clarify Okay, if no questions, then, so we have been discussing the importance of preparation of prior to trauma patient arrival and evaluation of mechanism of injury to determine the patient's potential injuries. Then we identify the correct sequence of priorities of assessment of a multiple injury patient. Then we apply the principle of primary and secondary survey to assessment of a multiple injured patient. Then we also discuss the importance of re-evaluating a patient who is not responding appropriately to the initial management and recognizing patients who require transfer to another facility for definitive care. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Uh, try to interact with discussions. Don't be afraid to talk, uh, right? So hope you will enjoy working in trauma. Thank you.